Hello, welcome back. This is day number 190, and it's my privilege today to read some of the most fantastic stories ever from 2 Kings 7 and 8, Psalm 126, and our first reading in John 12. Let's open to 2 Kings 7. Yesterday we heard two more chapters containing fascinating miracles performed by Elisha. The story about Gehazi getting the gifts from Naaman and the vision about the chariots of fire both have interesting spiritual significance to ponder. We come back to the story from chapter 7 where the Aramean army is surrounding Samaria. The famine is severe the king has sent an executioner to kill Elisha. And then, verse 32, Elisha was sitting in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, A murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following him. He had hardly finished saying this when the king arrived and said, It's the Lord who has brought this trouble on us. Why should I wait any longer for him to do something? 2 Kings 7 Elisha answered, Listen to what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow you will be able to buy in Samaria ten pounds of the best wheat or twenty pounds of barley, for one piece of silver. The personal attendant of the king said to Elisha, That can't happen, not even if the Lord himself were to send grain at once. Elisha replied, You will see it happen, but you won't get to eat any of the food. Four men who were suffering from a dreaded skin disease were outside the gates of Samaria, and they said to each other, Why should we wait here until we die? It's no use going into the city, because we would starve to death in there. But if we stay here, we'll die also. So let's go to the Syrian camp. The worst they can do is kill us, but maybe they will spare our lives. So as it began to get dark, they went to the Syrian camp, but when they reached it, no one was there. The Lord had made the Syrians hear what sounded like the advance of a huge army with horses and chariots, and the Syrians thought that the king of Israel had hired Hittite and Egyptian kings and their armies to attack them. So that evening the Syrians had fled for their lives, abandoning their tents, horses, and donkeys, and leaving the camp just as it was. When the four men reached the edge of the camp, they went into a tent, ate and drank what was there, grabbed the silver and gold and clothing they found, and went off and hid them. Then they returned, entered another tent, and did the same thing. But then they said to each other, We shouldn't be doing this. We have good news, and we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. If we wait until morning to tell it, we are sure to be punished. Let's go now and tell the king's officers. So they left the Syrian camp, went back to Samaria, and called out to the guards at the gates. We went to the Syrian camp and didn't see or hear anybody. The horses and donkeys have not been untied, and the tents are just as the Syrians left them. The guards announced the news, and it was reported in the palace. It was still night, but the king got out of bed and said to his officials, I'll tell you what the Syrians are planning. They know about the famine here, so they have left their camp to go and hide in the countryside. They think that we will leave the city to find food, and then they will take us alive and capture the city. One of the officials said, The people here in the city are doomed anyway, like those who have already died. So let's send some men and five of the horses that are left so that we can find out what has happened. They chose some men, and the king sent them in two chariots with instructions to go and find out what had happened to the Syrian army. 
The men went as far as the Jordan, and all along the road they saw the clothing and equipment that the Syrians had abandoned as they fled. Then they returned and reported to the king. The people of Samaria rushed out and looted the Syrian camp, and as the Lord had said, ten pounds of the best wheat or twenty pounds of barley were sold for one piece of silver. It so happened that the king of Israel had put the city gate under the command of the officer who was his personal attendant. The officer was trampled to death there by the people and died, as Elisha had predicted when the king went to see him. Elisha had told the king that by that time the following day, ten pounds of the best wheat or twenty pounds of barley would be sold in Samaria for one piece of silver, to which the officer had answered, That can't happen, not even if the Lord himself were to send grain at once. And Elisha had replied, You will see it happen, but you won't get to eat any of the food. And that is just what happened to him. He died, trampled to death by the people at the city gate. Second Kings 8 Now Elisha had told the woman who lived in Shunem, whose son he had brought back to life, that the Lord was sending a famine on the land which would last for seven years, and that she should leave with her family and go and live somewhere else. She had followed his instructions and had gone with her family to live in Philistia for seven years. At the end of the seven years she returned to Israel and went to the king to ask that her house and her land be restored to her. She found the king talking to Gehazi, Elisha's servant. The king wanted to know about Elisha's miracles. While Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had brought a dead person back to life, the woman made her appeal to the king. Gehazi said to him, Your majesty, here is the woman and here is her son whom Elisha brought back to life. In answer to the king's question, she confirmed Gehazi's story, and so the king called an official and told him to give back to her everything that was hers, including the value of all the crops that her fields had produced during the seven years she had been away. Elisha went to Damascus at a time when King Ben-Hadad of Syria was sick. When the king was told that Elisha was there, he said to Hazael, one of his officials, Take a gift to the prophet and ask him to consult the Lord to find out whether or not I'm going to get well. So Hazael loaded forty camels with all kinds of the finest products of Damascus and went to Elisha. When Hazael met him, he said, Your servant, King Ben-Hadad, has sent me to ask you whether or not he will recover from his sickness. Elisha answered, The Lord has revealed to me that he will die, but go to him and tell him that he will recover. Then Elisha stared at him with a horrified look on his face until Hazael became ill at ease. Suddenly Elisha burst into tears. Why are you crying, sir? Hazael asked. Elisha answered, Because I know the horrible things you will do against the people of Israel. You will set their fortresses on fire, slaughter their finest young men, batter their children to death, and rip open their pregnant women. Hazael asked, How could I ever be that powerful? I'm a nobody. Elisha replied, The Lord has shown me that you will be king of Syria. Hazael went back to Ben-Hadad, who asked him, What did Elisha say? Hazael answered, He told me that you would certainly get well. But on the following day, Hazael took a blanket, soaked it in water, and smothered the king. And Hazael succeeded Ben-Hadad as king of Syria. 
In the fifth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, as king of Israel, Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, became king of Judah at the age of thirty-two, and he ruled in Jerusalem for eight years. His wife was Ahab's daughter, and like the family of Ahab, he followed the evil ways of the kings of Israel. He sinned against the Lord, but the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah because he had promised his servant David that his descendants would always continue to rule. During Jehoram's reign, Edom revolted against Judah and became an independent kingdom. So Jehoram set out with all his chariots to Zaire, where the Edomite army surrounded them. During the night, he and his chariot commanders managed to break out and escape, and his soldiers scattered to their homes. Adam has been independent of Judah ever since. During this same period, the city of Libna also revolted. Everything else that Jehoram did is recorded in the history of the kings of Judah. Jehoram died and was buried in the royal tombs in David's city, and his son Ahaziah succeeded him as king. In the twentieth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, as king of Israel, Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, became king of Judah at the age of twenty-two, and he ruled in Jerusalem for one year. His mother was Athaliah the daughter of King Ahab and the granddaughter of King Omri of Israel. Since Ahaziah was related to King Ahab by marriage, he sinned against the Lord just as Ahab's family did. King Ahaziah joined King Joram of Israel in a war against King Hazael of Syria. The armies clashed at Ramoth in Gilead, and Joram was wounded in battle. He, Joram, returned to the city of Jezreel to recover from his wounds, and Ahaziah went there to visit him. Let's turn now to Psalm 126. Laughter, joy, and tears are in this often quoted psalm. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought us back to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. How we laughed, how we sang for joy. Then the other nations said about us, The Lord did great things for them. Indeed, He did great things for us. How happy we were. Lord, Make us prosperous again, just as the rain brings water back to dry riverbeds. Let those who wept as they planted their crops gather the harvest with joy. Those who wept as they went out carrying the seed will come back singing for joy as they bring in the harvest. And now, our first reading in John 12. In yesterday's reading, Jesus worked his biggest miracle so far in this story, the raising of Lazarus, and the Jewish leaders became even firmer in their plans to kill him. John 12 Six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from death. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped to serve. Lazarus was one of those who were sitting at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took a whole pint of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, poured it on Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the whole house. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas from the village of Karyoth, the one who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for three hundred silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. 
He carried the disciple's money bag and would help himself from it. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. A large number of people heard that Jesus was in Bethany, so they went there, not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from death. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too, because on his account many Jews were rejecting them and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the King of Israel! Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says, Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king riding on a young donkey. His disciples did not understand this at the time, but when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard that he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, we're not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it falls into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am, and my Father will honor anyone who serves me. Let me start us in prayer today. Lord Jesus, we would love to have been the one who lovingly and extravagantly anointed you at Bethany. What a great privilege it would have been to witness the raising of Lazarus. We would run out of the city to welcome you and to join those shouting, Praise God! Hosanna! God bless this king who is coming to rule Israel in the Lord's name. You did not come on a war horse, but on a donkey. Lord, in imitation of you, we want to serve humbly. Let us learn the secret of what you told the Greeks. Truly, a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it falls into the ground and dies. Help us to be among those who think nothing of their own lives in their devotion to follow you. So today, Lord, we make it our aim to forget ourselves and take up our own cross and follow you.